Heather, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Yes. And with human ventures, so many things to dive into. It's kind of actually difficult to even decide where to start with all the things you're doing there. But let's just give an overview for people who aren't as familiar. What is Human Ventures doing? Yeah. Human Ventures is, a, um, well, we call it a business creation platform because there's a couple of different components. We started our true bread and butter um, as a startup studio. So building companies from scratch. Uh, as we evolved, we now have a fun franchise too. So the funding platform, but we did things a little differently where sometimes people build up a fund and then have the platform. We decided to start with that operational platform. We're builders, uh, operators, and and investors. So um, that ecosystem is, has uh, worked well for us building in New York. Tell me about building that in the first place, like going that that route, just the decision to do it that way. You mentioned people maybe would have done the other route potentially, or there's different ways to go about it. But just how did you get to that in terms of the structure of what you wanted to create with Human Ventures? Yeah, I mean, our DNA is really um, New York City. And so we've now used that playbook across other industries and other, other um, ge- geographies. But New York, you know, it's a, it's a multi-industry you know, multicultural uh, melting pot. And so when we started Human, we said, we want to create a platform where founders don't get lost in the sea of the city, right? Why don't we create a, um, a, a quite frankly, you know, literally a physical location for everyone to come together and build and have that be the genesis. And so we had been tracking some founders for a while. We brought them in as entrepreneurs and residents. We're founders ourselves. So we founded that platform. Um, did a lot of things right, did a lot of things wrong. Uh, every, you know, we're always, uh, always learning. But my partner, Joe Marchese, the serial entrepreneur, um, I've been on the investing side for a long time, but I also uh, built uh, within a fund structure before. So it was a natural kind of progression to start that with human. And this was in 2015 when there just, there weren't many early stage funds in New York and there definitely weren't any platforms for builders to build together. So that was the genesis. In that time period too, I mean, what was the reaction to doing that? People you were talking to, obviously you had like a network in that as well. Like what was the reaction to that? What helped you also stay the course in terms of what you want to build? I'm curious. Yeah, the the people we went to to originally become shareholders of our studio were titans of industry because we said if we really want to help founders navigate New York and build real businesses, not just products, but real businesses across different industries, we want the heads of the banks and media titans who understand advertising and where the distribution's going. We want to bring together good humans from all these different industries and have them have a stake within our platform. So that's what we did in the beginning. And um, people got more and more involved. And I think the receptivity was really, um, well, it was great in the beginning where with everyone just saying, this is cool, this is something new. And then when you started to see it work and we had co- some of our companies started to hit then people said, well, okay, this makes sense that you're going to have a fund alongside it to be able to to fund those those projects. And now, you know, New York is the fastest growing uh, tech ecosystem. We've had multiple generations now of founders selling their companies coming back. And post pandemic, I think it's the number one place that founders have um, have seemed to really want to start their businesses. So we're excited about what's, you know, we're not just New York. We have um, investments in, and some builds in LA as well, but, um, but we really are bullish on the the diversity um, here, but also the the grit and um, ambition that kind of is the center of New York. We we started, you know, we started with that ethos. With that too, so diving a little bit deeper into the actual companies then that you were going to start from this. What were you looking for sectors you wanted? I know the the overarching it's human ventures. So I want to hear more about that in terms of the actual companies around like what you want to start in terms of, and then also like that process even for going about that. Yeah, there are two components to, you know, we go early pre-concept. We sometimes we build from, from pre-seed to series A, you know, it's just, it's early. So you're looking at um, who are the people you want to build with? Who are these ambitious founders that you've been tracking that you think anything they would do, <laughs> you'd give them money uh, or that you'd want to work for. Cause essentially you are working for them as an investor. Um, they think it's the other way around, but it's not <laughs> your investors work for you as a founder. And then, um, and then the spaces, you know, you want to be in and we're bullish on real businesses, real companies. So what we've kind of talked about is this human needs economy. It's what are the consumer behaviors, um, of the, you know, what are the trends that we're seeing? And we really said the human side of business, and that's come into focus in quite, you know, drastic measures 
especially after, you know, we experienced the last two and a half years. I mean, say post pandemic, but we're still in it, right? So they all came into focus. But, you know, right now, our focus areas are worker well being. So the human side of, of work. Um, and that looks like, you know, benefits for how the employer is taking care of their employees or upskilling their employees. How are you doing lifelong learning and career, you know, career changing? Um, we see a lot of that. So that's an obvious area for the human side of business. We have uh, a lot of health and wellness companies. We saw the rise in women's health care, mental health uh, very early. So we're in several of those companies that you've heard about. And then we think about um, experiential so how is online and offline experiential changing right now in travel, hospitality, uh, consumer behavior, shopping versus buying, right? What is the experience there? And then um, the new attention economy. So where's their healthy media being created? Privacy being tracked, or you're owning your own personal data, curation, things of that nature. So those are the four big categories for this next fund that we're, we're out to market soon with, um, we're really going to be focusing on. With that too, so with obviously the network you mentioned earlier, the titans of industry you have involved, and more broadly with the companies you've now started and then the companies you work with, like how do you leverage that in terms of those people, those, those connections and everything to one, help build more companies, help grow companies? I'm just curious about how that's like operationally or how you operationalize that network per se. It's a great question because there's a lot of tools that claim to operationalize the network and you know, you can use the tool, but it's only as good as the people, the input that you're putting in. And so something that we pride ourselves on, our, our network of people like yourself know how to build community in a really authentic way. And community is a term that is now thrown around way too much, especially with the whole web three <laughs> stuff and everything. What does that really mean? I mean, um, you know, one of my favorite books is Adam Grant's Give and Take and the dynamic of investing your time and energy into givers is a practice that I think um, that I personally in my life, I've really loved. It's just who are those people who naturally want to help without asking for return, you know, anything in return. And you know, there's this ecosystem, it's a currency. It's, you know, how do you create an alumni network? How do you create that affinity group where people have that mutual trust? It's really that you know that they're good people and that they're, um, they're putting their, their, giving hat first, and then also they're creating value within that network. So it might sound very conceptual, except for it's really palpable when you have a portfolio of founders who are natural givers to one another. So you start seeing this compounding effect and this kind of collective brain that gets to solve the problems for each founder and every founder benefits from that. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a unique way that we've operationalized our network. I always say you're only as good as your last response, right? So anybody can have anybody's email address now. It's not rocket science to figure that out. But are you going to get a response amongst all the noise? And you only do that if you create that goodwill um, on behalf of your brand. And then and then they'll, they're will they willing to help your founders. How have you personally just gone about that? I mean, you, you've done a lot of different things. You've built, built companies, invest in companies like how do you personally kind of manage that, all these different relationships? I know from uh, going through the process at Filize in terms of how we like, if you're raising a fund or if you're uh, investing in startup, there's so many different aspects of that. You have all these different relationships. I'm just curious for you as an investor, like, how are you managing all of that? It's hard. You have to, you have to, um, it's not something that you can, you can't, be too formulaic about it. It's gotta be something that's yeah. natural to you. And of course there's ways and spreadsheets and affinity or like Airtable. Some people have these amazing you know, data <laughs> minds that do that. I think you have to um, be able to hire people who also have that similar mindset and you have to create your structure and process and you're in your firm um, to that everything, everything does support that. Right. So we're very relationship driven. We do 50 events a year, whether, you know, now they've been virtual, but we do hybrid. We, we bring people across industries together, but the goal is always to create value for the people who are at around the table. And so you're not asking, what can I get from that? You're saying, how can I bring those people in the room that they're going to get value from each other? And, and that amplifies, that just starts to, to work, you know? And I think, um, if I could, if I could operationalize it in a, in a product, I definitely would. I, I've always looked for founders who are doing that. Some people are in, in starting to see signs of that in this next wave of founders. I think um, the EQ component is really, really important, right? IQs, table stakes, 
EQ is so important. And so people who have high EQ do understand that network effect and, and how they can be helpful to, to the people around them. Is that concrete yeah, enough? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. And I'm curious, like, how are your, I mean, with that too, the EQ side of it too, how do you screen for that or look for that, even in like the founders you invest in or, uh, you know, help build companies with, like, how, what do you look for for that? I'm just curious. I know there's like a lot of new investors that we're talking with at Vitalize Angels, just in terms of people who are just getting started investing for the first time or, you know, very early in their journey. And the EQ side of it, it's like hard to gauge and hard to judge. I'm just curious if anything on your end that's been helpful in terms of gauging that. Yeah. I mean, all the way down for our values, you know, we put on our website, it's our guide to being human. And one of our values is gratitude. And people are like, what do you, what do you mean? And I was like, if you find people who are truly grateful for the job that they're doing they're it's hard for them to be unhappy. It's hard for them not to think about how they can help others. And, um, and so it's like built within our DNA, but I think also there are ways that you, um, can, can evaluate founders in a, you know, LinkedIn is, 10% maybe less of who we are as people. So yeah. how are you screening for that? You have them meet other people in the in your network. You get you triangulate everybody's um, kind of perception of that. But it, I mean, it's a long life. And so uh, founders, everyone, your reputation is your personal brand, right? So you have to be able to make sure that you are genuine about, about who you are and how you're helping people and adding value. This is a people-driven business, no matter what you do. So <laughs> Um, so I think little things like that and then, um, founder referrals, right? So when founders can see the potential in somebody and they've, they've sent somebody over to work with us or another founder to invest in above all, you know, people, founder referrals are what I value. With a founder too. So in terms of the company is going, I want to just like give you a chance to shout out one or two and go a little bit deeper into maybe how you get them off the ground how, or how, you, how are you helping them? Uh, any ones that send out just in terms of like right now or more recently, recent investments, anything, we'll like dive a little bit deeper into that. Yeah. So some of our legacy companies that are now in, you know, more uh, top of mind for folks, current.com was one of our first um, investments and that's a challenger bank. They, but Stuart Sop, when he started that one, you know, it didn't matter how he was approaching the wedge in the market. He knew he wanted to create this uh, massive digital bank and he's been able to do that. And in under six years, you know, get to a, do a massive organization or business. We have a company right now called Groundswell, which is in the benefits, like more worker well-being area that's spearheaded by Jake Wood. Jake has been on a radar for a long time. He was a, um, a Marine. He's a vet. He's, he uh, started a nonprofit called Team Rubicon. And we look for a founder who, you know, I always say you, it's like training with weights on when you start a nonprofit. He, you know, uh, started this enormous nonprofit. He had 65,000 vets that have... Um, have uh, worked with Team Rubicon to to kind of they they go they deploy for natural disasters right they're civilians now and they deploy for natural disasters. When he stepped down from CEO of that, he knew he wanted to start a, a new business, and so we said, start with humans, start with the platform, and so we launched that um, with Jake, and it's it's a democratizing the donor advised funds for corporate benefit. So you're able to have your employees. Uh, be able to donate like the the big massive foundations but it was really around that founder right that was his expertise he knows how to build he knows how to build a team culture and he's a type of founder who i think is breaking through the next you know the next 10 years um eq iq together some of our um investments in healthcare you know we invested early in tia health which has been a big win recently um a platform for for women's health care that has exploded um, some more uh, vertically specific TBD health is a, is a, an investment it's at home STD STI screening and the care model around that um, which I think is just integral for women's health you know STDs are the number one preventable um, cause of infertility and I think that the next generation coming up is very aware of their sexual health so big part of health and wellness especially for females. Um, you know, I can go on and on. I, I think there are no, just at least one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more. Um, yeah. okay. One more that I'm really excited about. Um, I mean, I'm excited about them all, but, uh, clearly, <laughs> um, <laughs> 10 year Organics. I'll say 10 year Organics is one that we were there from the inception too. So they are creating, you know, a, a, an organic baby food brand, um, for the, the new parent, right. Next generation parent. It's, um, celebrating the first hundred flavors. So it's baby led weaning, but it's kind of like daily harvest for babies, right? It's frozen organic food. And during the pandemic really had a lot of tailwinds because 
couldn't get to the grocery store. You had, then you had this organic food, but it was in the frozen, you know, you could freeze it. And, and um, it's been a lifesaver for moms too. So they really use a community led um, organic uh, customer acquisition approach, right? Where they have these separate clubs in different, different regions. And the moms are those true advocates for, for this brand. On that note, which I'm glad you brought that up, actually, with product versus distribution, and if people have different opinions sometimes on that, in terms of which is more important, they're both important, but there's obviously a difference. For you then, how do you look at that or evaluate that in terms of these companies, like the distribution versus the product itself? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think these founders are so resilient. I mean, a lot of folks that we had right now, they said, okay, well, we're starting with DDC. We're going to you know, have the demand and then you go into retail. Okay. Then COVID happened. Every retail uh, shop shut down. That. Right. So then they had to, you know, pivot. And, and this is one, um, we have a alternative based protein company called loopy and they use the lupini bean. And that company was born under the fact that we knew that um, the vegan trend was was accelerating, but nobody wants to be labeled a vegan. So we saw an t- alternative-based protein kind of become, you know, commonplace. The lupini bean is the highest protein, lowest carb bean. Um, the founders are phenomenal. The brand is so exciting. They started with bars. They're going into pasta. They have all the, you know, these skews but they have gone completely D to C and they will go retail at some point, but it, it's definitely an online community that's been generated, right? And they're like high performance ambassadors that they have. They have people, they um, launched a marketing campaign on, on Republic because, um, because they wanted their ambassadors to be able to have, you know, an equity stake in their company. And it just shot through the roof. It's great. So I, I think the distribution just depends on the personality of the brand where they're reaching their customers in an organic way. And then naturally, as it grows, it'll go through the, the normal distribution channels. This is for CPG, right? The normal distribution channels that um, are, there's kind of a playbook for, but how are brands breaking through in the earliest stages right now? It has to kind of have that personality, I think, and that cult-like following. Yeah. And I remember talking to a couple of different people on my other show and like how they think about distribution in a unique, different way, especially with the different generations and different markets. It's like, you're trying to be more creative, you're trying to like the look and feel of it matters in different ways. And then even talking to uh, Matt Kama recently on the show, who he was talking about how, yeah, just looks at distribution a lot and how are founders being creative with distribution. And when you find that, like that, that in many ways is something that you very much so want to invest in then, because you see that you're like, okay, well, it says not just like, oh, we're going to put money into Facebook and Google. That There's actually more thought and depth in it, which matters because it's very competitive, obviously. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, my partner, Joe, talks about how we're in the subprime advertising, uh, you know, market right now with Facebook. You, you can't, that's baseline, but you have to now think about kind of best practices going back to the old ways and then thinking about new, you know, new channels of, of shopping versus buying. Well, like you mentioned, the supper club type of, type of thing, dinner, dinner. And that's just exactly a different way to think about distribution. And, uh, we actually had that same idea for Vitalized Angels. Gail brought it up one time. She's like, we should do like a Tupperware party for Vitalized Angels. It's like people talking about angel investing. And, and it's like, we're trying to think differently too. And I love founders that are doing that. And it makes us like, okay, well, this person's really, if they're thinking about it that way, like I can see where the growth can get to because of how they can execute on it. And I'm curious with your platform as well, with the pre-seed incubator side of things with like humans in the wild, it mentioned like a hundred day sprint from what I read. What does that look like? What does that entail? I'm curious. So that was born out of, we, you know, we had entrepreneurs and residents who were, who were building with us and it was kind of at an ad hoc basis. And, you know, when founders were starting to build, they'd come in and then we saw one year just in 2018 it exploded how many people that were in that kind of camp. So New York started to become the place and, and you said, okay, well, you can either build in your living room or you build in, inside of, you know, human or some of the other funds that were here. And so we said, well, what if we created not a, not an incubator, but, um, but more of an entrepreneur in residence program or a studio program where you had that hundred day sprint that we really had the discipline internally to work, um, you know, out an industry and we, we operationalized it and COVID hit during that time. And it was kind of a perfect time for founders who were alone in their apartment, early stages of building to have a cohort based model of, of building together. And um, so we did, you know, category focus, we did health and wellness, we did future of work. And then the next one we did was um, diving into women's health care and mental health specifically. And the, um, the curriculum is, you know, a lot of accountability but also peer peer led groups. And so you really do create that, um, that 
like the alum network of humans in the wild is some of the most tight knit group of people because you're kind of going through the trenches. Not only did you have this external force of COVID that was happening, you, know, <laughs> you were also building yep. your business during that time. And, um, and so you'll never forget that time in your life and go, people you go through that with are really, really instrumental. So we, that's where you start to see if you have one or two that hit rising tide lifts all boats and that goes back and that, that creates that flywheel, right? When you, you hear about the PayPal mafia or whatever it is, yeah. it's, you know, it creates success begets success. Um, and that just takes time. So we're seeing, we're reaping those benefits now, you know, of, of several cohorts and then they recommend others and. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, everything from in the weeds to helping to launch and, and building to building out models and, you know, just having the resources that you, you need at the early stages. With your experience and everything you've done with human ventures, and I know that in the last two years with things opening with COVID, obviously things have changed a lot in terms of ecosystems around where venture capital and everything and startups are being built. And New York's huge hub of that right now but for other people who are maybe are in different hubs or different areas trying to grow more of that ecosystem in a place i mean any any thoughts around how to start that how to go about that uh, i think it'd be fun to kind of have some opinions from you i do have some of those opinions you know I, you see these other um cities that have had an ecosystem that's built up and it's usually around a haloed founder who's had su success right whether it's um, from from QuickBooks or it's from Exact Target and, and Indie or whatever it is like there's these hubs around it. So I would say find people who have an affinity for that region and who have had that success. And then I think the more you can lean into what are the um, what are the kind of advantages of that area? Is there you know you, you see in where High Alpha set up their shop they're another studio they know that there's b2b sales um executives who make really great founders of b2b SaaS companies that you know you can you can really um, lean into that and now they've created a whole ecosystem and people you know investors fly into that you know and, and then and you can create from that one thing i think tulsa you know with gkff they've done a good job too at creating you know what are some of the the um kind of hubs and community that you can build around that and find that there's always going to be, uh, you know, that magnetism around some of the early founders who want to get back to the ecosystem, because that's the genesis of it. Who, who are the successful founders that, that knew that those early angels were the people who started with them, but now like funding is ubiquitous, right? It's now we can do this through zoom. I think the pandemic blasted open everybody's, um, if anybody had apprehension to invest in other areas, it's just not the case anymore because people are just trying to find value. So I think less hype and more um, more metrics, like fundamentals driven, the further you way, are away from the coasts and then people will really recognize value. And if you have something of value, then the money will find you. With your with what you've done on the, the investor side of things, but also as an operator, I mean, just Chris, on the investor side of things, becoming an investor and taking that leap per se, why, why even go that, that route versus an operator and running, like I'm just, you are running a company in this way because you're a company, but I'm just curious on the, why that switch. Yeah. I mean, because now I can, like, I, I think <laughs> that we're, we're coming into an incredible um, point for women in venture specifically, but also people who can, um, uh, value founders early and and try to bet on yourself in that way, picking stock in people. Um, I love operating, but I, um, you know, I did Kaufman Fellows. I fell, I fell in love with this industry a long time ago, and there really wasn't a spot for people, um, for women at the table. And right now you're seeing, um, it's not just gendered, right? But you see where there's arbitrage opportunity where there are new lenses, right? Where there are new yeah. viewpoints and perspectives. So for me, um, you know, I, I think that this is the most exciting time because if you can pick people six to 10 months ahead of the market, you're going to have the absolute arbitrage opportunity. And it's not going to be forever, right? Our, our area is going to be made efficient soon too. And I'm already seeing <laughs> yep. Gen Z investors coming in and, and like blowing me away, <laughs> you know? And so <laughs> yep. it, it's just the evolution of things. But right now I'm, I'm really excited about where we sit. I love that. I, I think, yeah, with what Human Ventures is doing, if people are doing something, something different, using new models, trying to innovate is like the most exciting part of being in this industry. And obviously we see it all the time with the founders we talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but also on the VC side, there still needs to be a lot of change, uh, a lot of progress to be made, obviously with underrepresented uh, investors as well as founders. Uh, but I think we'll, 
I, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that things will change, but people like yourself continue to push the envelope on that. Where's the best place for people to learn more about Human Ventures, connect with you as well if they would like to? Um, I'm a Forbes contributor right now for VC and emerging managers, um, Twitter for sure. Uh, and, you know, I, I started um, with a bunch of female founder fund managers. We started something called Transact Global, which is now over 300 female fund managers. So if you're a fund manager and you're looking and you started your own firm, um, that's a great resource. Uh, but I also want to say, like, I want to direct towards Vitalize, like the, what you and Gail have been creating is just phenomenal. You ask about different cities and how people can find, like, you're the connector and you're somebody who has done this in such an incredible way. Follow you guys on Twitter. You'll see who we connect. You know, we talk all the time and I think you just follow those networks. You know, you follow where the energy is, you follow where the people are who, who are really enthusiastic about founders and saying, you know. Gail's threads are some of the most astute. Sometimes they're super simple and super, you know, in depth and thorough. And I think they're kind of timeless. And so I just wanted to throw that back at you too, that you guys have been able to really create the, the different approach to investing. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll pay you later for that. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will say, I will say if anyone's trying to get into VC and like following along on Twitter and on, on what people are posting, one, you can learn a lot. You can actually make connections. You can start, you know, connect with founders as well and have that network. Like, there's so many ways to go about that now in the digital age more than ever, I think, that it's like, if you if you want to, you can get in and you can find a way to make an impact, whether it be starting your own firm, whether it be joining someone else, whether it be on the operational side as a founder and understanding more of how the venture side works. There's a lot of different opportunities if you search for it. So search for it. But I appreciate the kind words a lot. Thank you so much for the time today, Heather. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. I look forward to doing more with you.